All right, good morning. Good morning. Okay, good morning. All right, Jamie, um, Jamie is unfortunately a little ill today. She's been feeling under the weather for the last week or so, so she's not going to be able to make it. We got news of that uh, late yesterday. Um, so you get to hear me for a few more minutes. All right, um, my name is Alex Jules. I'm the executive director for the Fellowship of Free Thought. Today is October 21st, 2012. It's close enough to 11. All right, do we have any visitors today? First timers? We have several. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for showing. Um, okay, a few things that I wanna cover before we get really underway. In the back, we have uh, a bake sale going on, um, anywhere ranging from $1.50 to I think $7 in uh, baked goods. The proceeds to that are going to the Light the Night, um, Light the Night event, our team actually. Uh, we are in pretty much a dead heat with Metroplex Atheist. How close? The proper answer is no. That pushes people to buy more. <laughs> you haven't done this often. <laughs> but we do need to say the camp quest um, is really low. So the camp quest raised about $500. So we need to make up for camp quest tax. Definitely. Yeah, OK. <laughs> blew it. I just blew it. <laughs> OK. Um, and, and, and honestly, it is um, the Lymphoma and Leukemia Society. Uh, we do have a team represented, uh, I guess, on this side by the fellowship. We've got uh, Metroplex Atheists also, which we're competing against. And then, of course, uh, Camp Quest. Um, and all the proce proceeds go there. Um, anyone who uh, has followed the story or drama associated with Todd Stiefel and the American Cancer Society would understand exactly why we're behind this one, Todd is actually going to be matching some percent of the proceeds. So every dollar really does count. Okay, um, let's see, second, uh, Will and Christy and Lily are safe in Charlotte, the Fortins are safe in Charlotte, on base. Um, they got there a couple of days ago, so um, I know they're watching, don't be strangers, you'll be missed. I know you'll visit soon and often. Um, with our family, our Free Thought Family down three, we will actually be growing by one. And is she in? Is she in here or did she walk away? Okay, so when you do see her, Whitney is expecting, for those of you that don't know that. Yeah, she just announced. <laughs> no more coffee for you, Zach. <laughs> You're so done. All right, um, so congratulations to that family. All right, so as a child, I was fascinated with the X-Men. Any mutant lovers out there? Yes, yeah, living vicariously through comics, yeah. Um, and, and what was really interesting as a child is one of the things that I identified with was living the dual lifestyle, right? Of course, um, having your thoughts and belief or disbelief in some cases and having to have that alter ego and we always uh, wear masks just like they do. So um, if you can imagine me in a Wolverine costume at the age of seven. Um, okay, Cyclops was actually my favorite. Um, so mu mutants are, are different. Um, one of the things that is always recurring in the themes of the movie and in the book is the fear people have of, of being different. Um, that's what's made a lot of that particular genre so compelling. I mean, you see it popping up and sprouting in a lot of other TV shows and, and movies, et cetera. Um, but we always challenge that fear on whether it's a rational fear or not. I mean, is, is it truly um, something that we should be embracing? Because diversity is something that goes with evolution. That's how we got to where we are today. One of the, uh, well, I'm going to introduce Zach, Dr. Zachary Moore, and ask him to come up in a second. Uh, one of the first things that we're going to do is go ahead and start off with an activity that is going to uh, very much uh, look at evolution um, 
especially ev evolution in the uh, state of Texas, which I don't know if anyone who's been keeping track of the news knows that that has been under fire for the last six, seven years, I guess actually since we actually started talking about evolution, it's, it's been in, under fire in the Midwest and the South, but Texas uh, School Board of Education, the elections have been very important because we're constantly uh, looking at revising history, revising science, and you know, again, we're dealing with this issue, something that should have been settled a long time ago uh, with the scopes trials continues to be addressed. So, Dr. Zachary Moore, will you come on up? Yes, so today is Mutant Day. Raise your hand if you're a mutant here today. That should be everybody. Everybody raising their hand because we are all mutants. I don't know if you knew this, but every single person, just the, the very fact of uh, the process of meiosis and mitosis that, that results in a human zygote um, actually carries with it about 100 individual brand new mutations. So we are all mutants. We all have about 100 different um, points of difference between everybody else in this room. So we're all mutants. And why is mutation um, important to talk about? Well, mutation is the engine of, of evolution. Mutation is what um, creates the diversity that's in every population of, of any sort of life form that exists today. It is the, the, the raw material that the selective forces act on. Without mutation, uh, things get boring really quickly. Without mutation, um, you have any sort of challenge in the population, you end up wiping them out. And that just, uh, that's, not, that's not really good. So mutation is a very good thing. Um, and, and speaking of things that, that mutate, um, you know, the, the science standards here in Texas um, have been subject to change uh, for a while. And uh, there's been, a, as Alex was mentioning, there's been some um, insertions, uh, some, some sort of genomic insertions into the, uh, into the science standards uh, by certain people that, that want our kids to be taught things um, like um, creationism, maybe not explicitly creationism, and, and even really not explicitly intelligent design, they've been sort of savvy enough politically to move away from that. But they have had this, this impact on our science standards here in the state of Texas. And that gets, you know, people who appreciate science, who recognize the value of science, that gets us really worked up uh, and in a bit of a lather. And that is a good thing. However, looking on the other side, as Jamie um, is often very interested to point out, Several, um, the, the, the science standards overall, yes, there are these little creationist mutations that are inserted, but the science standards overall in the state of Texas are really very good. Um, the top schools in the state get together and design their entire biology curriculum around the, the dogma of, of central dogma of biology, which um, we all understand and, and is supported by evolution. In fact, um, as Jamie says here, the Conference for the Advancement of Science Teaching in Texas <clears throat> included this quote uh, from Theodosius Dobzhansky, which says, nothing in biology makes sense except in the context of evolution. So that was what our Texas teachers have to say about evolution. That's not the politicians, that's not the people on the school board who have uh, other influences, but the teachers, the people on, on, the, on the ground level, the people that are trying to make these policies, they really understand, they really get it. And, um, we could go through these standards, but you know, th they all ended up being uh, pretty good. You know, analyze and evaluate evidence of common ancestry among groups. Analyze and evaluate scientific explanations concerning data and from the fossil record, how, how natural selection produces change in populations, not individuals, of, uh, you know, common misunderstanding among creationists. Um, analyze the elements of natural selection, including inherited variation, uh, producing more offspring than can survive, um, the finite supply of environmental resources, re reproductive success, all this stuff, uh, these are our actual science standards and they're, they're pretty damn good as, as Jamie says. Um, so that's just sort of a, a background to, to what we're gonna do today which is what Jamie really wanted to do and she, I, you know, I just wanna impress upon this, she's really broken up because this is one of her favorite things to do. She um, does this in her science classroom uh, regularly, and this is going to be an activity focusing on the mechanism 
of evolution. And so what we're going to need to do is, first of all, have everybody as condensed as possible. If you're, if you're in a table that doesn't have a full complement of people, we need all the different groups to, to come together because this is going to be a group activity. And what I'm going to do, and Alex, maybe you can help me with this, is I have here, I have a common ancestor, a design of a common ancestor that I'm going to take the, and, and pass around to every single group here. And basically, it's going to be kind of like the game Telephone, right, where you start with one sentence and then you pass along to the next person, you pass along to the next person, you pass along to the next person, right? Except we're going to start with the design, a body design. And the first person to get this at their table is going to take this design and then they're going to draw a copy of this. And then they're going to take that copy and they're going to pass that copy along to the next person. And then that gets along to the next person, to the next person, the next person, until you get to the end of the table. And then we'll see what the final result is from that table. So it'll be kind of like introducing mutations along the way. Every time you draw the design, it's going to be a little different. And you're going to pass along to the next person. They're going to use that as their template. Okay? So let's get those passed along. But 
meanwhile, in a nearby borough, there's another cricket saying, well, you listen to this blowhard. I mean, I want to mate as much as the next guy's cricket, but you don't hear me announcing it to the whole meadow. Actually, that gives me an idea. And he jumps out of his burrow, and he silently sneaks over to intercept the approaching female. He gets between her and the guy that she's looking for. And she's so crazy with lust, she sees him and says, oh, I like your song so much. He's like, yeah, yeah, my song. That's right, that's a ticket. Yeah, I'm the one who's parasite free and all that. Scratch, scratch, scratch. And she says, she had me with the song. Now, less talking, more mating. And uh, the, uh, the couple uh, retired for some uh, exchanges of uh, genetic material. And the original strong, loud calling male is out of luck. And he's saying, last chance for you special ladies to um, uh, meet a really great offer. <laughs> and in fact, his song is so loud that it's attracted some unwanted attention. And here there comes in this bat. He says, oh, I'm almost there. Keep chirping, you big juicy bozo. And so in this case, the sneaker male gets to mate, and the singing attractive male gets eaten by a bat. So see, survival of the fittest isn't necessarily about being the toughest, fastest, or most attractive. It's really about surviving to pass the genes on that encode traits that and certain behaviors to your offspring. So maybe the sneaker males kids will inherit those sneaky genes, and in turn you see behavior like your father. And they're saying, well, why waste our energy singing with someone else before us? Why don't chum? <laughs> of course, toughness can help to increase an organism's chance of living long enough to reproduce, maybe even get big enough to scare away the bats. But reproduction and the passing on of genes are most important in terms of evolution, and there are many ways that an individual can get their genes into the next generation not just by being the biggest and the strongest. So calling is still a good strategy for male cricket to increase their chance of mating. Females are attracted to calling males, and there won't always be sneakers or predators around to derail their, their uh, opportunities. And if they all used the silent sneaking strategy, then no females at all would be attracted uh, to any crickets. And the males would have some long, lonely nights. You got two males, well, why don't somebody start calling? Well, no, uh, why don't you? Well, why don't you? So nobody ends up doing it. So what we end up with is a variety of successful mating strategies, and that's how evolution, natural selection works, a variety of strategies. There is no one true ultimate survival strategy. A successful strategy is whatever gets the job done. And then he actually steps on a chirp, on a cricket. Um, so then the discussion questions are there on the back, and that's what we can discuss in our groups. So survival of the fittest, remember, means that the strong succeed and the weak fail, right? Well, no. That's how often how it's portrayed, but the real story is a bit trickier. So when it comes to crickets, what does the what does we what do we actually mean when we talk about a cricket being fit or not? And is calling, is that actually good for the cricket, for the fittest or not? And we can talk about examples of selection of work in the in the cricket story, and let's also talk about examples of how selection and fitness works among ourselves, among humans. What are some of the strategies that humans use? What are some of the good ones and some of the bad ones? So let's talk about that in our groups. While well, everybody who has the, the drawing keeps working on their drawing, okay? Let's go to it. So is this exercise just being overwhelming for some of you? I mean, more paper? Who else needs more paper? How far have we gone around the table? Did you not have pencils? <laughs> we're, we're still going. If yeah. No. Nope, um, once around the table. I got one done. Okay, fellow scientists, uh, if you can nominate one person from your table, yes, it is going to be one of those. Uh, nominate one person from your table to talk and uh, review what you have observed.
All right, here we go. Okay, so one table went away from that. So you all started with the same common ancestor, and you went to, uh, it's going to be hard for you all to see in the back, but you went to cute and cuddly in some instances, right? Okay. Uh, you went actually really lean and almost ultra aggressive, almost, almost velociraptorist, right? To this, to this. <laughs> which, if you haven't seen it, uh, <laughs> this, this, this is this 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 more more looks like uh, protoplasm. So this is more like de evolution, <laughs> right? So yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> Zach, welcome back. <laughs> So yeah, so this is you know this is amusing, and, and Jamie has some um, some examples of things that her students have come up with. You know, she like I said, she uses this in class to, to illustrate how you can start with one form and go in a number of different directions. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to see actually, but she, the the students basically come up with the same sort of weird versions of the same designs. Um, that one kind of looks like a duck almost. There's another bird like bird one. Oh, this one's a, like a swimming bird or something. <laughs> oh, there's a scary one. Uh, that one's not, a little, not quite so scary, but it's got big claws. That one just kind of looks big and dopey. Um, that one looks pretty good, but he's got some sort of a long tail for de defense and uh, and all sorts of different things, but but so that's that's the uh, that's the um, that's the thing that one Texas teacher does with with her kids to to sort of illustrate this principle of mutation and how forms can change uh, from successive generations and how you can start off with one common ancestor and result in many different forms. Uh, like for example, the um, what was what was told to me yesterday when I was in Austin at the Texas Free Thought Convention, there was a preacher. Uh, near the near the capital, who was uh, informing me that, well, evolution is a lie because obviously you can go down to the zoo and see monkeys in the zoo. So, if evolution is true, you know why are there still monkeys, right? So somebody that says something like that obviously has really no conception of what it means to have a common ancestor. So of course humans didn't come from monkeys. Humans and monkeys and all primates have a common ancestor. So. Uh, that was that was kind of interesting there, and uh, unfortunately, that was kind of the best that they had to offer in terms of uh, Christian protesters there. So I hope next year at the convention they um, they boost it up a little bit. Yes, sir. Did you have any preachers that wanted to argue about clothing? No preachers that wanted to argue about clothing, actually. No. No, the, no, not the evolution of clothing. Yeah, that was a. Alex is mentioning a, a, a preacher that we met here in Dallas who um, thought it was. Um, a destructive point uh, against atheism or against evolution to say that, well, how did clothes evolve? Why did humans start wearing clothes? You can't find any fossil evidence of clothing. <laughs> well, okay, if that's, if that's really what's getting between you and good science, then I, I don't know, I don't know what to say there. Um, but that pretty much closes out our activity and our discussion. And did anybody have any 
particularly salient points uh, from maybe talking about the crickets, talking about fitness in general that they wanted to share with the group? No, not so much. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. It was, open, to speak up a little more. it was open season on facts and, yes. and history. Um, can you talk a little bit about where we are today with Sam? Now, last time, mm -hmm. when, and we tend to not talk about elections, but last time, um, you know, when you looked at the Board of Education in Texas, mm -hmm. they had, they almost had a policy of excluding So where we are today is, is much better than where we were two years ago. So last, the last time that, we, that the Texas School Board came into sort of public focus, um, it was because the, the, the chair of that board, Don McElroy, was basically pushing an effort to get um, his, his worldview, which is informed by fundamentalist Christianity, in, in, injected into the, the state curriculum. And he was uh, successful to a point um, but then, fortunately, he was voted out of office. Um, so the very first time that his, his uh, appointment came up to an actual vote, he was voted out. And some much better people came in. Um, if you recall, uh, FOF member Amy Parsons was running for school board. She was running against Tinsey Miller in our district right here. Um, and Tin Amy, Amy lost uh, in the primary, but Tinsey Miller then lost. Uh, to another gentleman who I, I think was a, a much more of a rational person than, than she is. So the, the situation for the school board right now is much better. It's not perfect though. And as I mentioned, the science standards ended up being pretty good. There are a couple loopholes that allow teachers to bring in intelligent design, creationist stuff into the classroom if they want. But the standards themselves are really good. Um, the, where the, the, you know, the board is, is informed by some brilliant people, some good policymakers, but ultimately the board itself makes the final decision and it is heavily influenced by politics. So that is sort of the caveat there. Um, the last time they revised standards, it was not with the sciences, it was within history, the history standards. And they did so in, in a way to downplay the role of minorities in uh, Texas history and basically boost the, uh, the idea that, that Texas is, um, is special. And of course, we know that it is special in our hearts, but that it's not objectively special and that the people that, that came here and settled didn't do everything right. Um, so they tried to downplay that to a certain extent. But fortunately, we do have um, good people that are still fighting the fight. And actually, in this election, every single seat in the board is up for um, replacement. So um, go out and familiar, familiarize yourselves with the candidates and then vote as your conscience directs you uh, at the election uh, next month. Yes. You know, I don't know. I got that from Jamie. She uses that in her classroom. Okay. Um, I, I want to ask you a question. The bad, I don't think the bad hearing voice with the sound wave, I think they generate some kind of sound wave out to receive the wave. Right. So the bats, bats do uh, navigate primarily by echolocation, but that is audio. So that it is, it is able to hear. I mean, it's able to navigate. It's able to create a um, a three dimensional representation of its environment by the the clicks and and the bounces and, and things like that. I think that the story is writing like a more uh, kind of a layman terms. Mm -hmm. This will be a, a a problem because if the bat has that kind of ability to generate the sauna, so three click it will be sensed. Yes. So it's not necessary the biggest one will, will be That's true, but the loudest one probably would be, and that's that's kind of the point of the story. So the bats is probably gonna be attracted to the loudest one. 
So if the biggest and the and the you know the strongest crickets are the loudest ones, then the then the bats are going to pick those off first. Well, that could be, I mean, that's definitely the case. Bats aren't everywhere at every time. But if a bat is close by a loud cricket, then, then he would pick that, pick that guy off. So. Yeah, or I, a girl. I don't think that it makes it like a very, very, like, uh, everybody can understand. Standard. I would I would think that it would be better to teach the science, like, really, really research, what's the nature, okay. what's the behavior, mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. They specifically learn about every animal, everything is about them. If we don't have a lot of knowledge about all those species, uh, you come to make mistake, when you make mistake, it's hard to establish an argument on top of that to argue about. It. Okay. Well, I'll definitely take that and pass that along to Jamie. Thanks. Yeah, how good are the teachers in, in your experience in Texas? It goes to the teachers, yes, that's true.
So we have a few minutes left um, before we'll bring things to a close. And uh, so I thought that I might, I was down in Austin, as I mentioned before, for the Texas Free Thought Convention yesterday. And I was able to give a, uh, a stump speech of sorts. A um, number of people were asked to, uh, to stand on the south steps of the Texas State Capitol. And, uh, and they had a sort of a, a rally for, for atheism, for free thought here in Texas, which was really cool. Uh, Dawkins was there, Matt Dillahunty was there, Arn Ra was there, Jessica Alquist was there, it was really cool. And uh, so I thought I might just close out um, with, the, uh, with the speech that I gave, um, because it's, uh, I'm pretty uh, in enthusiastic about the message here. So this is what I said. I said, you know, I consider myself to be pretty lucky to be in Texas. I wasn't born here, but I got here as quickly as I could. I came to Texas in 2005 because Texas is awesome. It's awesome for many reasons, but the one that impressed me the most was that Texas has a world-class university system. And after I received my doctorate up north, I wanted to work with some of the best and the brightest scientists in my fields, so I came to Texas. Texas, in case you didn't know, boasts seven Nobel laureates six of those in the sciences, including four here in Dallas at UT Southwestern Medical Center where I spent a year-long fellowship before transitioning into a career uh, in medical writing for oncology. And speaking of oncology, you know that Texas has four National Cancer, Na National Cancer Institute recognized uh, cancer centers, one here in Dallas, one in San Antonio, and two in Houston where our friend and inspiration Chris Hitchens received uh, treatment for the disease that ultimately took his life. But the medical research that's conducted here in Texas also saves lives every day. And the CPRIT initiative uh, that was started by the state of Texas is putting three billion, with a B, dollars into vital cancer research that's being performed by the world-class institutions that we have here in the Lone Star State. So yes, Texas is awesome. But you know, Texas has also been awesome for a very long time. In fact, Texas had only been a state for three short years when a thousand atheists from Germany showed up here. They called themselves the Freudinkers, or free thinkers, and they settled down in, around Austin in the hill country. The German free thinkers were anti-authoritarian, they were pro-democratic, and they were disciples of the Enlightenment. They loved science, and they had no time for superstition. And they strongly opposed the intermingling of church and state. They opposed blue laws, they opposed religious instruction in schools, they opposed religious oaths in government, and they also opposed government-led prayers. Um, I'm sure Rick Perry is not aware of that. But they also opposed slavery. Now this put them at odds with their Texas Confederate neighbors during the Civil War, and that unfortunately didn't work out so well for them. But the German freethinkers remain a powerful example for us here in the 21st century. They were not afraid to stand up for their beliefs, to claim the moral high ground while their religious neighbors succumbed to superstition and bigotry. So, let's hear it for the German freethinkers and their legacy, all right? <laughs> Weren't they awesome? And I want to continue what they've started here. So yes, Texas is awesome. And when my little boy right in the other room was born in January of this year, it got even a little bit more awesome. And I've learned a lot from him in the few short months he's been in my life. He's one of those lucky ones that uh, Dawkins likes to talk about, but I consider myself lucky too to be his father. And up right here in Dallas, we've got babies popping up left and right, right? Whitney Ford is, is the next one in line. And it, that's really awesome because it's nice to have friends that are going through parenthood uh, as we are too. And it's also nice to have lots of hand-me-down clothes that we can pass around throughout the group. <laughs> But it's also nice to know that these kids, my son and his young friends here, are going to be raised in a very different culture than what I grew up in, in what most of us grew up in. Because we have a tremendous demographic advantage here. Because the Pew, Fuel, the, the Pew Forum research, you're all familiar with that, the Pew Forum research shows that the religiously unaffiliated in this country is growing like crazy. That demographic, in just a few short years, there will be more people who are religiously unaffiliated than there are Roman Catholics, if you can imagine that. And right now, the youngest generation that exists, there's one out of every three are religiously unaffiliate, unaffiliated. So it's getting better. And by the time my son is old enough to give talks here at this podium, I, I estimate that it'll probably be fully half of the population of America will be religiously unaffiliated. That's where the trends are taking us. 
And as this is happening, we're seeing big changes in our cultural landscape. We have a president that finally acknowledges that we exist. We've seen atheist books exploding in popularity, and we've also seen the rise of grassroots free thought organizations just like the FOF um, and what was happening in Austin this past weekend. And eventually we'll see a society that doesn't bat an eye when someone mentions that they happen to be an atheist. I also predict that we'll see atheist mayors elected soon. We'll have atheist governors eventually, and I'm convinced in my lifetime we'll see an atheist president. Kids like my son are being raised in a culture where not believing in God is not going to be a big deal. And in fact, it's already happening. At Camp Quest, Texas, I've talked with kids that already are starting to notice that their friends don't quite care so much that they're not religious. And that wasn't the case just a few years ago when we had our first camp, but it's sure happening now. It's starting to make a difference what we're doing. What you are doing is starting to make a difference. And religious believers are starting to take notice of the differences too. Just a few weeks ago, I was at a conference at a megachurch down in Dallas that was organized to help Christians deal with the threat of atheism. Yeah, that's right. Christians in Texas are afraid of atheism. That's what they called it, a threat. What are they afraid of? I'll tell you, they, they actually said what they're afraid of. They're afraid of running into an atheist in a coffee shop and having a very simple conversation there that would end up devastating their worldview. And I can tell you, they're right to be afraid because for the average Christian, the best example that they had on display there at that conference was a famous apologist, I won't say who, who thought it would be a good demonstration of the strength of his religious convictions to debate for an hour with an empty chair. That was the best that they had on display. Now, I don't want to be too hard on our religious neighbors here in Texas. After all, I used to be pretty religious myself, and I still have many religious friends that are good people, thoughtful people, but Unfortunately, they are significantly outnumbered by all the other pew potatoes that exist. And you know what else? We conducted a survey in the DFW Corps last year that showed that 80% of us, 80% of all of us here used to be pretty religious at one time too. So I try not to be too hard on them because, you know, I, you, some of you may know I like to visit churches around the area. And when I do, it's a little comforting to know that I'm meeting lots of future atheists. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Those of us here have adopted a reason-driven life, but it's not gonna end with us. People are dropping out of pews left and right, and they're showing up in our growing and multiplying free thought organizations all around the state, here in the FOF and all over. We'll still have small-minded cheerleaders in tiny towns to deal with for years to come, make no mistake, but they are the last gasps of a dying culture, so don't worry about them. Make no mistake, we have the intellectual high ground we have the moral high ground, and it's only a matter of time before we have the cultural high ground too. So I'm telling you, stand up and be proud to be out as atheists. Atheists in Texas, in fact. Let's hear it for cheerleader taunting, coffee shop haunting atheists in Texas. And what makes Texas awesome today is that over the past decade, people like you and me have been seeking each other out looking for others like us that have Professor Dawkins' books on our shelves or Christopher Hitchens' books on our shelves, and we have organized. We've organized like crazy. You know, they say when, when, when you go to Texas, things are bigger there, and they're not lying because the atheist and secular community here in Texas is bigger and more active than anywhere else in the country, possibly even the world. There's thousands of atheists here in Dallas-Fort Worth, and there's thousands more in Houston, Still more thousands in Austin, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, Lubbock, Waco, Tyler, Amarillo, and El Paso, all, around, all across the state. We are atheists, we are free thinkers, we are humanists, and we are Texans, natives and newcomers alike. We are Texans too. We are teachers, we are nurses, we are builders and dentists and students and musicians and photographers and pharmacists and poets. We may not believe in God, but we are Texans too. We cook meals for the needy. We pick up trash along the roadside. We collect food and clothes for the homeless, and we donate blood by the gallon. We may not go to church, but we are Texans too. We love barbecue, Tex-Mex, Asian and Indian and Polish and soul food, turnip greens and bacon, vegan blueberry pancakes and kolaches down in Austin. We may not say grace before we eat, but we are Texans too. We adopt animals from shelters, adopt children into our families, we go to PTA meetings, we help kids with their homework, and we bake cupcakes for their fundraisers. We may not send our kids to Sunday school, 
but we are Texans too. We are Democrats and Libertarians and Independents. We are Republicans and Moderates and Hippies, but we all care about Texas and we vote. And when we vote, we may not pray in the voting booth, but we are Texans too. Say it with me. We are Texans too. So remember that. Remember that anywhere you go, anywhere you, anywhere you see other Texans, anywhere you see any other atheists. So be proud to be Texans, but you can be extra proud to be Texan atheists. We are atheists, we are awesome, and we are Texans too. Thanks. I'll close this up. Okay. Uh, yes, we're going to close, however. Um, all right, there, we do have the donation boxes out. All right. um, as Zach stated, very well, thank you. Um, this organization is possible because of the contributions of uh, people like you. Wow, was that straight out of PPS? No, <laughs> <laughs> was, where's Big Bird? Um, okay, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but truly, um, next week, and I, and I really do implore you, next week we are going to be meeting at the Resource Center in Dallas. Uh, I've posted the event on Meetup, and we also have it um, Facebook, um, hate, uh, Facebook invites as well. Uh, it is our open forum and general roundtable. We are going to be talking about a few things, and we want your input. If you are, um, if you are active, inactive, somewhat active, et cetera, if you are a member or affiliated with the fellowship, we'd like to see you there. We want to talk about the next 12 months, the next 60 months, the next 10 years, what, uh, what the organization is going to look like. Some of the topics that we're going to be discussing uh, include, you know, we have a, um, uh, a dedication towards education and educating our children, et cetera. One of the things that uh, have been put on the table is a FOF or fellowship scholarship fund that we want to go ahead and, and open up for some of our children. Uh, we want to talk about the permanence of the organization, uh, et cetera. And we also want to talk and seek um, you know, additional active members that uh, are looking at either you know, hosting additional events or getting active with the board. Um, you know, we have a board of 12 and, you know, we don't have specific term limitations, but some of our time will be up soon and we, we do need, you know, members that are willing to stand up, learn the organization and, and get active. Um, and we are growing. We are still growing. We're over a thousand registered on Meetup. We're pushing 1,100 at this point and with a growing organization, we need more people to stand up, be counted, be heard. So if you can make it, it is next week, 10.30. Uh, we've got 90 minutes allotted, 10.30 a.m. Um, on Sunday, actually. Um, again, it's out there. And uh, I hope to see you all there. Okay, so with that, I think we're gonna have the kids come in and talk to us about what they did. All right, can everybody hear me? All right, so today we worked on a few things. The first one we did was called the elephants toothpaste. This is where you take hydrogen peroxide, mix it together with a little bit of yeast, and you get an explosive reaction, which is the release of oxygen into dishwashing liquid. If you haven't seen it before, look it up online, you see a video. The other one that we did was, <clears throat> actually, people probably hear me. Okay, so the other thing that we did was mixing together oil with water. You just get the difference about molecular density. Water will go to the bottom, the oil will stay on top. We mix a little bit of food coloring in it, so when you add alpha seltzer, then it will your tops.
With that, I'll go ahead and, uh, un well, let's see. Does the board, anyone from the board have any announcements that we need to put out there? No? Justin. What? Ta table in the back corner. Don? Okay. All right, so that's for a betting drive. All right. Anything else from any other board members, directors? No? Okay, with that, um, again, remember we do have some baked goods in the back. Andrea, I think, still has a few that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to empty the table if we can. All right. And we got potluck. We're starting right now. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month. <laughs>